Hello, my name is Dr. Jessica Dodge Overstreet. I'm a saxophonist and music theorist, and I'm really excited to make this video today uh, about score studying the first movement of Janine Rueff's Sonata for Unaccompanied Alto Saxophone. I've been wanting to do this series for a long time in order to combine sort of those things that you learn in music theory with actual performance practice, because I think that's kind of a gap that we can fill in our music theory pedagogy. So. Without much ado, we're going to jump over to the score. I will say this is the first of two parts. I'm going to start with a more basic approach where we're just finding general sections. And my goal is to make this accessible to anybody who can read music. And then I'll have a second part up that will be a little bit more in depth and that might be better suited to people who have studied music theory formally, but I'll do my best to explain all the concepts so that hopefully even if you haven't you can get something out of that. So subscribe hit the bell for notifications so you can see part two and leave a comment to let me know what you think of this video or to suggest other pieces of saxophone repertoire that I should do next. Alright, here we have the score for the first page. And the very first thing I try to do when I score study is to find the beginnings and ends of musical sections. This allows me to kind of figure out where my goalposts are, what I'm leading towards, and what I'm coming from. This piece is in free atonality, which means there aren't really these tonal markers like cadences to tell us where the beginnings and ends of things are. So we're going to have to use different strategies. Now, the very first strategy I'm going to use is just space. Janine Rueff leaves some big rests that kind of tell us where uh, one section starts and the other ends. In addition to space, she uses repetition and she uses changes in character. So we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to find uh, logical gaps where there's space left between sections. We're going to find repetition and how that delineates sections. And we're just going to look at the general character of these lines uh, as they stand. So very first, we're looking for space. Starting on this first page, there's not a lot of space. Most of the rests are pretty short. But if we go to our next page, to page two, we see this pretty substantial break here at the end after this kind of climactic moment. So I'm going to go ahead and say that that's probably a gap between sections. Moving on, now that you see the kind of scale of space that we're looking for, in this next page, you might not see that kind of space. I will say this has a similar sort of pattern to the last one, and we'll come back and talk about this during repetition. But combined this space and that space, I think that we've got some space starting a new section here. And if we look at the last page, again, there's not a whole lot of space, although this long note that kind of fades down I think kind of creates that space in and of itself. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to page one. Now I'm gonna start looking at repetition. So if you've played this piece, if you're studying this piece, or if you've heard it a few times, you know already that there's a lot of repetition at the beginning. We get this little figure once, twice, three times, along with this figure the same number of times to create this kind of overarching repetition of this figure three times. Now, we'll talk about this more in the next video, but uh, we kind of want to figure out whether we think this is introduction or actually part of the music itself. Is Janine Rueff just introducing the music or are we actually getting kind of some meat of the music? And we'll talk about that in video number two, kind of strategies I use to figure that out. But we already see some strong repetition there. We're going to look for uh, the next instance of this, because if you know the piece, you know that this little lick happens a few times. And the next time it happens is right here. We start getting these overarching collections, but we have to kind of pick out only some of the notes. There's an embellishment that can kind of distract from the pitches that we're looking for, but there's the second repetition. And then again, we have some extra notes in between it, but same pitches, we still have three repetitions. And you can see we even have this kind of matching rhythmic pattern. So I'm going to say that this will signal a new section. And if we look back, we actually have repetition before it as well. We have short, short, long, short in this sort of rising and falling. Same thing here and same thing here. Three times. One, two, three. Moving forward onto the second page. We don't see as much direct repetition. 
but hopefully it's already kind of starting to jump out at you when we see things three times. We have this high F sharp three times in a row here, right before the end of this section. As we continue to move on and look for that opening theme, we find not quite the theme here, but we do find the same kind of general theme. Here's one iteration. And again, we have to start uh, chunking out embellishments here. We have A, D, B flat, A, D, B flat. So there's another iteration. And then B, F, G flat, A, D, B flat. Here it is. This is kind of the hidden version like we had last time. But yet again, we have three repetitions of this. This is a pretty strong sign that we've got some sort of delineation here. Looking forward, when we turn to the last page, you can probably see that we get the exact repetition of the beginning again, starting here. We get the kind of clear direct version where you don't have to guess. We get each of the two little sections that combine without any embellishment. And again, if we look back, we see this little short, short, long, short, rising and falling pattern again to help delineate where the section is. And if you look at the very end of this, here we see another one, two, three repetition here, and we get the opening little repetition motive up an octave. The same exact way that it's been appearing, but now it's up an octave. So we've seen this figure several times. Clearly it's important and it's structural. And we can now see that Rueff is using this kind of division. I would maybe put a line there even, but Rueff is using these uh, repeated motives to delineate between sections. So if we go back to the beginning, we can now start to add that final layer, which is looking for shifts in character. We see here that the opening is full of accents, forte to fortissimo, uh, lots of really stark dynamic contrasts, lots of tonguing. But then, about a third of the way down the page, suddenly we get mezzo forte dynamics, this giant slur, sevens, you know, not irregular groupings, there's less rest. There definitely seems to be a delineation here. Now, we've already marked in the delineation when it goes back to that opening, so we'll mark in, lastly, and this kind of continues on to page two, we get that smooth section again. We also get an obviously new section here at the 816. Hopefully this has already jumped out to you as some kind of new section in this music because we switch meters. Now, instead of having these kind of longer lines, we have these shorter uh, slur two, tongue one sort of groupings that go along with the asymmetrical meter. Notice too, if I look before this divide that I just found because of the character change, we see short, short, long, short. It's actually the inverse of that short, short, long, short pattern that we saw before, before it was ascending and coming down. Now it's descending and coming up. Another pretty clear sign that we have a new division or a new section. And this section uh, proceeds all the way through to the end of here. But as we'll talk about in the next clip, we could probably even break this up further. So if you're jumping into a little bit more sonata theory, you might already be wondering what the big sections here are. We're going to go back and we're going to make sure we delineate those smaller difference between accents and slur sections in the end, and then we'll chat about that. So we get this section slurred. We already have marked off where we get the accents again. This is where we get the slurs again. And on page four, we already have marked where we get the accents again. And we already have marked kind of the transition into this 816, that new pattern again, and lastly, where it ends. So hopefully you can see that we've found kind of the seams of this. We found the edges of sections. Now we need to kind of piece this together into a more cohesive whole. So how are we going to do that? Well, We'll talk a lot more about kind of the nuances of this, the sonata theory behind it, how it's organized, how the themes are organized in the second video that's going to be a little bit more advanced. But for this one, it, we can kind of boil sonata theory down into knowing that there's an opening section 
It's called the exposition. And in that we expect to meet most of the themes. And then there's a middle section called the development where just like it sounds like we're gonna develop those themes. So they get moved around, combined, shortened, lengthened, played with, and then we get the recapitulation, which restates the opening material. So as we look for these kind of big sections, this A, B, A, overarching pattern, we're gonna look for, first of all, really, really obvious delineation. And second, just what I was saying, is this something that seems stable and thematic, or is this something that kind of feels like a lot of music being recycled? So we have kind of our three main types. If you will, we have our accents, we have our slurs, and we have our running 16s. Well, we can't have the development until we've met all of our characters, if you will. So if we look at the end of this last kind of character, we have this big section here, and we've marked an end. And if you look right after that end that we've marked, we start getting the 816 combined with some accents. This is very similar to that opening. So we can say that this is probably where the development starts. And I'm gonna go ahead and write development. So if this is where the development starts, the next thing we need to find is where the development ends. And the development, simply enough for our purposes right now, ends when we get familiar material again. So we had that section going until here. I'm just gonna point out really quickly. One, two, three little blips that end on a G. So at this section, we come back to the slurs. If you know a lot about sonata theory, you might be already thinking, this is not the P theme. If that's what you're thinking, just hold your horses, we'll talk about it next video. But this is definitely music we've already had. In fact, we had this music, uh, not quite the same, but we had this music on page one. So it definitely seems like by here, we're in the recap. Now, uh, we'll talk about this more, I promise, in the next video, but a lot of folks actually put the recap all the way here on page four because this is where we get the opening material. And I'll talk more about the next, I'll talk more in the next video about why I don't think that that's the case, why I think the recap comes that page before. And we can see that once we have that sort of uh, familiar material, we get slurs, we get accents, we get slurs, we get accents, we get that running material, and then we get kind of this coda, codetta at the end. So knowing when you're in the A section, when you're in that development where everything should be kind of uh, combining and mixing and experimental, and then when you should be back at the end where things should be clear and back to that thematic material can really help you delineate and give shape to this overall movement. So instead of shaping each you know, three note phrase, each line of phrase. Now you can shape kind of the macro phrasing. So leading all the way to the end of the exposition through the development and back to the recapitulation. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way to the end. It was super fun to do. And like I said, I will have a part two up that goes a little bit more in depth and talks about sonata form a little bit more deeply. So please subscribe and hit the little bell so that when I get that done, you know about it. And please, if you made it all the way to the end, leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought, uh, any questions you might have, or like I said at the beginning, any topics for the next video. Thank you again so much.